Channel 36, WTVQ-TV, Lexington. And now, 36 Eyewitness News. Dave Winters, Mike Hartnett, and Frank Faulkner. Central Kentucky's most complete report of news, sports, and weather. Good afternoon. The state police trooper who shot and killed fugitive murder suspect Clyde Graham died today of a heart attack. Authorities say 49-year-old Sergeant Eugene Coffey of the Elizabethtown Post was stricken this afternoon while driving along US-31 near Fort Knox. Coffey was the principal figure in the state police investigation of the circumstances surrounding the death of the 22-year-old Graham, who was being sought in connection with the slaying of Trooper Eddie Harris. Coffey was a 25-year veteran of the Kentucky State Police. Residents in low-income housing are faced with many critical issues. A group of concerned representatives met today in Lexington to work out strategies to help solve these problems. Shelley Spivak reports. The Rural Kentucky Housing Coalition is working together to make low-income housing more enhanced for those that need it. The coalition was formed in July and is concentrating on major problems, including affordability, safe, and sanitary housing. Officials from Frankfurt and Washington attended the meetings to advise the group and to take back a platform to present to state and federal officials. What we hope to achieve is, is very simple, to present to federal and state agencies and uh, to the extent we can to Congress uh, the issues confronting low-income housing opportunities and production and to make suggestions as to changes that uh, can be had to better achieve the programs. One misconception brought up about low-income and rural housing is that the residents keep their homes in bad conditions and are lax in paying their bills. But one discussion leader says that's to the contrary, and that is one of the issues that this group hopes to clear up. Shelley Spivak, 36 Eyewitness News, Lexington. Lexstrand needs help and it's asking Lexington citizens for a piece of their paychecks to maintain services. Shelley Whitehead has that story. The proposed 0.142% payroll tax increase would mean some $2.2 million to Lextran. Company officials said this amount is needed not only to maintain present services, but also to provide the additional necessary improvements. With money generated by the occupational tax, the company could balance their budget. 7% of that budget is presently unfunded. Other benefits include new, smaller buses for off-peak hours, expanded bus routes and lengthened hours, improved maintenance, and an expansion of the Popular Wheels program. Without the tax, many bus routes would either be ended or greatly reduced. About a dozen Lextran employees would be laid off and maintenance would suffer. A specific area of emphasis for Lextran service is the University of Kentucky. The company held a student forum at the college last night. And although few students showed up, Lextran assistant manager Alex Roman says there are many ways of gaining revenue from the college. Other universities have had the same problems that the University of Kentucky has had in terms of parking congestion, uh, traffic congestion on arteries leading to the university. And what they have done is through a pricing structure, price their parking to encourage people to use other means of getting to schools, either bicycles, walking, or public transportation. What we have here is, for instance, it costs $36 a year to park at the university, uh, $25 a year roughly to park in the, in the parking deck at, Co at Cooper and University Drive. When prices are that cheap, there is no incentive to seek substitutes. If the university were to restructure its parking, it would realize increased revenues that they could use to fund more bus service for the university and take up their fair share of the ridership on the Lextran routes. And what would all this mean to the average Lexington worker? Well, according to Lextran officials, about 15 additional dollars a year in payroll tax. Shelley Whitehead, 36 Eyewitness News. A tree has been planted on the lawn of the governor's mansion to honor the birth of the state's first son, Lincoln George Tyler Brown. 36 Eyewitness News reporter Barry Katz has this Arbor Day story. This little fellow may not be aware of it, but he has got to be the most famous youngster in the state. The C.V. Whitney family honored his birth by the planting of this dogwood on the front yard of the governor's mansion. I think this is a very special way 
and a very special gift to give a young baby when they're born. And we want to thank Mr. and Mrs. C.D. Whitney for their generosity. The First Lady stole a little of the show from her son with a few announcements. Shooting will begin in the second week of November on a new movie from Columbia called Stripes. Olivia Maggard, executive director of the Kentucky Film Commission, says a third of the picture will be filmed in the state. So we've been working on this thing since July. We had to find things like a Czechoslovakian military installation and a, an Italian military installation. We had to duplicate the Czechoslovakian countryside, and now we're looking for people who can speak Russian. So it should be very exciting. It starts mid-November, and we want anybody who's interested in being in the film to contact us at the Kentucky Film Commission. And a $2,500 scholarship fund will be awarded to two Kentucky students majoring in theater arts in memory of stuntman A.J. Bakunas, who died in the movie Steel, filmed in Lexington. Barry Katz, 36, Eyewitness News. Ronald Reagan has left the campaign trail for his rented estate in Virginia. There, he'll prepare for a televised address on the economy. He'll also be boning up for the debate with Jimmy Carter next Tuesday. Meanwhile, the president traveled to New Jersey today. It's a state that he hopes to carry in November, a state he lost to Gerald Ford in 1976. We have two reports. Florida and South Carolina, Reagan shifted his strategy, emphasizing what aides describe as the competency issue, attacking the president's ability to lead the nation and run the government. From the outset of the Carter administration, the nation has watched as the important issues of our day fall into the hands of people whose motives are certainly not in question, but whose fundamental understanding of how to lead America is woefully inadequate. In Greenville, South Carolina, Reagan also charged that the Carter administration may try to adjust the consumer price index, figures that are scheduled to be announced later today. It's possible they'll jimmy the figures again to make it look like we've turned the corner and things are getting better. If they do it honestly, we'll find out that he has an economic record of misery and despair unparalleled in recent history, and it isn't turning a corner or going up. Reagan made a final stop at a Tennessee hoedown before he headed to Wexford, his rented Virginia estate. He does not intend to return to the campaign until after Tuesday's debate with the president. Today, Reagan will videotape a 30-minute speech on the economy to be broadcast as a paid political advertisement on the CBS television network. He plans to spend the remainder of the weekend preparing for his debate with the president. Joe Benton, ABC News, with a Reagan campaign in Kingsport, Tennessee. The president goes to New Jersey hoping to salvage a state he lost in 1976, a state his own polls indicate he could well lose again. Four years ago, Gerald Ford beat Mr. Carter by two percentage points. But Carter's strategists like to point out Ford was a moderate incumbent, and Ronald Reagan is not. And the state has a history of voting for moderate candidates. It does not have a history of voting for candidates uh, at, at the far ends of the uh, political spectrum. Uh, Governor Reagan is clearly a much more conservative Republican uh, uh, than was uh, Gerald Ford. Carter aides admit they have problems with New Jersey's unemployed auto workers who blame the president for their lack of work. But next Tuesday's debate with Ronald Reagan will include an attempt to depict Mr. Carter as labor's best friend. Strategists say the key to victory will be the size of the turnout. They need a big one in New Jersey, where conditions are similar to Michigan, the state in which the president ends today's campaigning. Bill Greenwood, ABC News, the White House. Supreme Court Justice William Brennan directed the Carter administration today to postpone indefinitely the transfer of 650 Cuban and Haitian refugees from Florida to Puerto Rico. The transfer was to have started early next week. Brennan has called it off until the full Supreme Court reviews an emergency request to stop the transfer on public health, public order, and environmental grounds. The request was filed on behalf of the residents of the Puerto Rican city earmarked for the transfer. Independent presidential candidate John Anderson is still campaigning hard. Today in Buffalo, New York, Anderson called upon President Carter to make public any secret dealings that he's had in relation to the hostage situation in Iran. This is in sharp contrast to Anderson's earlier campaign stance on the hostages. Shift, Anderson is now challenging the president to tell the American people all that is being done to secure the release of the hostages. I don't think we want October surprises. I don't think we want to feel that we have decided this election uh, on the basis of, uh, of some slate of hand that has gone on. 
where moves have been made and decisions have been taken uh, and concessions have been made that we don't know about when we go into the polling booth on the 4th of November. Just 24 hours earlier, Anderson told reporters that there would be plenty of time after the hostages were released to investigate the administration's handling of the matter, and that he didn't want to say anything that might jeopardize their release. But at a news conference, Anderson explained his reason for the new challenge. For all too long, we've accepted this idea that debate and discussion somehow prevents their release. Is there any reason to think that not discussing it has accelerated their release? They have been in chains for almost a year. Anderson denies that it is only because of his low standing in the polls that he has now chosen to attack the president on the hostage issue. And with just 11 full days before the election, Anderson is saying the presidential veil of silence is unacceptable. Mike Von Frem, ABC News, Buffalo, New York. A long and powerful earthquake jolted south-central Mexico today. Authorities report at least five people were killed. The quake collapsed buildings and sent hundreds of tourists and office workers fleeing in panic into the streets. The tremor was felt in the capital of Mexico City and registered five on the open-ended Richter scale. The quake was centered some 120 miles off the Pacific coast of Mexico. Crews are keeping a round-the-clock watch on an aqueduct near San Francisco. There's a fear that further flooding in the area will cut off the water supply to a section of the Bay Area. Details from Ken Kashwahara. The embankment had been fortified to hold back floodwaters that poured onto 5,000 acres of California farmland when a levee broke three weeks ago, causing $14 million in damage. But the embankment collapsed as a freight train was crossing it, sending the floodwaters onto another 5,000 acres and sending two unmanned auxiliary locomotives and a boxcar plunging into the water. There were no injuries, but about 25 farmers and their families were forced to flee to higher ground. The major fears now are that the floodwaters may cause other levees to collapse, flooding even more farmland, and that the pressure from the water may collapse these pipes. The pipes supply drinking water to more than a million residents in San Francisco's East Bay area, and although the area has a six-month water supply stored in reservoirs, officials say damage to the pipes may force them to impose water rationing. Ken Kashiwahara, ABC News, San Francisco. In Atlanta, police report no new leads in the investigation into the murders of at least 10 black youngsters. And the psychic enlisted by police is turning her attention on the whereabouts of the missing children. So far, she's had no results. ABC's Al Dale reports. Willie Mae Mathis last saw her 10-year-old son Jeffrey last March when he left the house to go to the store. I'm sure this has been terrible for you. I think he should be found. I believe you're going to find him too. I am. Just because of your faith. I will find him all the more. I won't let up until he is found. She said her feelings led her to search along this abandoned railroad track two miles from the Mathis home. But the search, which included police officers and reporters in tow, turned up nothing. The task force investigating the dead and missing children, meanwhile, is being deluged with reports involving children. Many are kidnap reports that are not substantiated, reports that have to be checked out and take up valuable police time. Skeptics believe the psychic also is taking up valuable police time, but law enforcement agencies continue to call on her. A district attorney in rural Alabama says he will ask Mrs. Allison to come over there after she finishes here and help solve the murders of four elderly people. Al Dale, ABC News, Atlanta. The rain has arrived just in time for the weekend, so the next question for Frank is, when is it going to end? Well, we enjoyed it so long. You know the picture, Dave. Thank you, Frank. The Labor Department says its consumer price index rose 1% last month for an annual inflation rate of 12.7%. That increase is the worst since June. The economy has been a central issue in the presidential campaign. There's been no comment yet from Republican Ronald Reagan or his aides on this, the last major government economic report before the election. However, there was comment from the White House. Presidential News Secretary Jody Powell says he doesn't consider one month CPI an indication of failure on the anti-inflation effort. Northern Kentucky customers of Union Light Heat and Power Company will soon be paying more for their natural gas. The State Energy Regulatory Commission has approved a $1.3 million hike for that utility. The rate hike reflects higher rates charged by the utility's natural gas supplier. The hike will result in a $6 increase in the average yearly gas bill. There ought to be some uh, messy football games on high school fields tonight. Oh, you're not kidding. It ought to be sloppy out there. Two games in town tonight, but first of all, let's talk about some... Oh. 
Securities markets have demonstrated impressive advances accompanied by equally impressive activity throughout much of this year in spite of countless uncertainties surrounding our political, economic and international outlook. In tonight's business report, Bruce Jamison takes a closer look at what this may be telling us about the months ahead. It has long been held that the market acts as a barometer in discounting or forecasting future events. As such, no less than five separate market indices have gone on to hit new all-time highs during the month of October. They have, however, been accompanied by more divergences than we have seen in the marketplace since very early in the advance, which began in March. Certainly from an economic point of view, signs of an upswing are numerous and unmistakable. Consumer spending and housing seem to have clearly come back to life again. I would anticipate a modest recovery in 1981, and during the fourth quarter, I looked at the economy to cool. The coming economic expansion expected for the coming year is not likely to be as vigorous to past post-war periods. The consumer spending, for example, is not likely to be as vigorous as the case has been in the past. Politically, any uncertainties or anxieties that any of us have are about to be dispelled within the next week and a half. Will the market make another reassessment of the situation at that time, or is it already discounted in the current price level? We are going to have a muddying effect. I would say a great deal of it has somewhat been discounted, but should there be surprises in the election, uh, should the international situation muddy up, uh, it's very difficult to tab. I would say that during the coming months that there will be uh, some uncertainty, some reassessing, and uh, probably towards the end of the year we'll begin to regroup and look at 1981. Well, I'll look for the uh, Iran Iraq situation to have a minimal effect on the market. Uh, we've faced a situation in the past. This is not too uncommon to the situation we had during the Iranian Revolution. Uh, the advantage that we have during this period is that we have an adequate uh, oil supply and high oil prices cut down on demand for us. However, should the crisis continue for another six months, uh, I would anticipate that the oil prices could possibly rise as much as 35 percent, uh, therefore having a negative effect on the economy. If the advances to date in the market were telegraphing a short economic recession, the message appears to have been correct. If the increasing signs of selectivity and market divergence appear to be telling us something else, it may be that the economic expansion next year may be less vigorous than in prior recoveries. Until we're clear on the signals, neither the economy nor the markets appear to want to commit themselves. This is Bruce Jamison. All too often we've had to report the grim news of traffic accidents along Versailles Road. Just two weeks ago, three people died following a mishap there. Versailles Road is the subject of this week's editorial from WTVQ-TV General Manager Bill Service. What to do about Versailles Road? It's one of the most...